I think we have uh, passed the start, so uh, then yeah. I would like to welcome uh, all of you attendees to this uh, webinar. Uh, Techna is organizing webinars uh, and we have had quite a few on different topics this year. And uh, today the topic is uh, we have invited a guest speaker from our, our customer in Norway. Kongsberg uh, Defense and Aerospace, uh, which is a long-term good customer of Technia in the air, um, in the domain of both Nova and Katia, and uh, and for um, a couple of three four years actually we've been looking into to uh, the area of systems engineering uh, together with Kongsberg using the Enovia and the CATIA solutions. And we are very fortunate today that uh, Gudrun Strand, Mrs. Gudrun Strand, is uh, joining us uh, to talk about this, uh, uh, how they have been uh, using the solution and some of the experiences so far. Uh, mm. So, if you are ready, Gudrun, I will um, give you the hand. See my presentation now? Yes, I can see this loud and uh, very good. Perfect. Um, so, I work in Kongsberg, and today I will talk about the local Hawk project and how we do model-based systems engineering in that project. Uh, first, an introduction about local hawk, and then I will go more deeply into the model-based systems engineering and model-based systems engineering in CATIA. First of all, I want to show you a little film from the local hawk project this year. Nå er flyet ferdig. I dag skal vi først teste at alt fungerer slik som det skal. Og så skal vi vise det frem. Vi skal demonstrere det for hele missivdivisjonen. Når vi står med propellene opp, så er det jo løftekraften. Det er egentlig bare bestemt av hvor fort de her spinner. Men så fort vi begynner å tilte de her frem, så er det vingene som gir oss løftet til å holde oss oppe. Så vi er usikre på om vi får nok fart fremover, eller skal vi si luftstrøm da, over vingene, til å få nok løft her til å holde oss oppe. So, uh, this was a sneak peek of the project, so now I will continue with the slides here. So, uh, this is a project in the Division Missiles. It was established in 2008, and uh, it has been growing every year. And last year, we had 23 students working to develop a drone. And the thing is to uh, develop a um, UAV that, that can identify and film cars competing in a folk race. And a folk race is specially known in uh, Norway and Sweden. Here you see the cars. It's quite cheap cars. And um, our plan is to follow the car during the race and you can film one particular car. Even if it crashes or drive out of the raceway, you shall be able to film it. So this is the racetrack. You can see that the cars are holding quite um, high speed at the uh, straight uh, end of the race. And in the curves, they are slowing down, of course. So there are a few. Um, yeah, it can be a bit difficult to be able to film it, but that's the task for the students. So the technical solutions in the project are based on our own expertise here in Division Missiles. 
that will say that we have systems engineer, we have image processing, mechanics, electronics, software development, uh, guidance, navigation and control. And we have supervisors uh, supporting the students and we have a project manager. So this student project is reflecting a real development project. So the purpose of the project is to recruit the best students. It is to test new technologies and processes like this model-based systems engineering and of course to gain publicity and to get a strong brand among students and show that we are responsible in motivating students for engineering studies. And the students, they will get knowledge and know-how that they don't get at school. They will try, try how it is to work like a real engineer. And of course, the students, they come right from school with um, fresh ideas and innovative thinking. So it's a win-win situation for all. So what's the link between missiles and local hawk? Many people ask, why should you develop just an airplane, an RC plane or a quadcopter you can just buy from a shelf. It's because um, the local hub project is actually quite similar to missile development. They are both complex systems with all the different uh, subjects that I showed you. And the main top technological topics are almost the same like aerodynamics, autopilot development, etc. And they are, of course, both knowledge-based developments. It is because of the, the knowledge that we can be able to develop uh, the local hawk within only seven weeks. So the differences are, of course, time span. A uh, local hawk project lasts for seven weeks during a summer, while missile development takes uh, decades. And when it, it comes to resources, the, in the local work project, we have 23 students, but uh, in the missile division, it works about four to 500 people. And local work is non-commercial and not military classified. So that is the reason why we, uh, we can have students working on the local work project, but we cannot have students working on the military graded projects. So therefore, we can also present this project to people like you and describe a little bit how we work um, through the Local Hawk project. Uh, and the challenges are the same, or mo many of the challenges are the same between Local Hawk and missile development. How can we be able to do the right things at the right time, to be to finish at the, a given date, when the students start working in June, they know that they will have a test flight in August. And at that time, it shall be a completely working prototype. It shall up in the air flying. And how can we transfer knowledge across disciplines? Uh, when the students come here to work, they come from different disciplines at school. Some are software students, other are mechanical designers and they shall understand each other to be able to make a complete system. And how can we make essential documentation and how well easy accessible from year to year? It's like when the students come here in June, they cannot be able to read through all the material the students last year made that will take too long time. So they need to find information uh, and the essential information and be able to to uh, get known, known to it in a very short time. Uh, and how can we let engineer uh, do engineering and not do a lot of documentation that they believe is necessary? That's the main challenges. And to overcome the challenges, uh, we have put an organization uh, with 23 students, about three to four students per group with both theoretical and practical skills. We have the brightest minds and people with, uh, who are both theoretical 
goods and people who have been having a lot of practical experience. And we are organized with a steering committee from the division and we are having a project manager for this project. I was a project manager last year and about 10 tutors, one to two tutors per group. And six of the students uh, from this year's local hawk were also participating last year to ensure continuity. And we have a student project manager for daily follow-up. And uh, as Ketil said, uh, in cooperation with uh, DASO and Technia, we two years ago, we started having system architects to see the overall picture and to be sure that uh, people are cooperating well and they can uh, see the links between the different disciplines. And when it comes to work processes, uh, we have the model-based systems engineering and lean product development. We use visual project boards for planning and we have a short stand-up uh, meetings uh, so we can plan almost from day to day so that everything will be on time. And we have A3 documentation for information storage and uh, that information will be stored in the an RFLP model in Katia. I will tell you what that means. It's a model-based system structure where we store uh, models and visualize the documentation rather than have long written records. And of course, the way to success is rapidly testing in this project. So then I will go over to the model-based systems engineering. Uh, RFLP stands for requirements functional view, logical view, and physical view. So what is that, you might say? Uh, to define a view in general, we can say you're going to build a house. And in the middle, uh, this is your vision about the house. And then we see that um, to build a house, you need different specialists and they need different kind of information. Uh, the architect needs information from you about how you want your house to look. Uh, the brick layer needs information about the ground conditions, etc. And the electrician are going to put up the light bulbs, the wires and the fuses, etc. And they all need different kinds of information to be able to build the house you want. So you can say that people look at things differently and they need different kinds of information. They see things in different views like we engineers do in a development project. So the RFLP can we also put in our development uh, process. Uh, first we have the customer who comes with a need and then we have to define the stakeholder requirements and analyze the requirements. Then we make up a logical design, which is the same as conceptual elements, where you have not defined the exact shape or type or kind of product or component, but it's a idea of a kind of component or product or part. And then we do functional decomposition of the of the product or the system I mean and then we do the loop once again until we find it implementable and then we have a physical product that we can inter integrate, verificate, validate and deliver to the customer. So then we have the RFLP also in the product development process. And translated into a RFLP model and local hawk, we can have this image where we have requirements, we have a functional view, logical view, and a physical view. That's what we see in the CATIA model, as I will show you. And we also have the behavior. That's something we think is important. It's how the customer 
describes his needs and how he wants the system to operate. And that's the foundation for the requirement and the functional decomposition and the logical decomposition. And then we have our A3 documents linked to the different views, so it shall be easy to find and um, rather compared to uh, a Windows Explorer uh, where you store the documents here you can find find it by looking at the visual figure if you're wanting the information about the wing design you can either get look into a function uh, which said generate width or you can look at the physical view and click on a wing and find the information so if we go into the model here we see um, uh, the top level of the logical view. It's what the customer wants. Uh, we see a system consists of a car race, an operator, ground station, a UAV, and support equipment. In the, the CATIA model, we also see in the navigator tree we have the requirements layer, functional, logical, and a physical layer, where we can switch among the different views. And in the background, you see different uh, designs, the physical views. These are different three models of the local Hawk drone from 2012, last year, and this year. Um, as you see here, you can look at the le left top of the slide uh, where it's indicated if you are in the RFLP and uh, the requirement, functional, logical or physical part of the, this, uh, the system. First of all, we have the concept behavior. That's uh, the, the consumer's needs and wants, it describes how he will um, the system to operate. He wants to transport the UAV into a car, unload it, prepare it, uh, launch it, he wants to fly it, operate the camera, when he lands he wants to extract the data from the payload, then process the recorded data etc. And when it crashes, of course, then here's there's a flight error. Then I want to transport it back to the UAV. So this is a kind of way to visualize the wants from the customer. Uh, you can use it for the marketing people can use it and all the different engineering disciplines can look at it and see if they have understood what you should do. And from this we extract the requirements. So the top function in this case is to capture video of a race car. If we zoom in, we can see that there's input information, race map, race information, real-time UAV observation, there's human interaction, etc. The output shall be UAV movement and video for processing. We use pictograms for these functional parts of the model, while for the logical, pa pa logical parts we use hand-drawn sketches. So this is the top function and here allocated to the top function we see all the top requirements, the titles of the requirements like uh, speed of race cards, launch time, picture transmission, peak frequency, etc. So this is the icon you shall look at after if you are looking for different requirements. Then at top level we have added an A3. This is an example of an A3. It's a uh, an easy way to understand the documentation. It's not a written report about the different concepts. It's some pictures and a matrix, which uh, uh, consists of the top requirements here. And we have been chosen 
to use a vertical takeoff and landing aeroplane for this drone, for this system. Um, one of the top function is to film cars during uh, a folk race and we know that the cars, they can stop, they can crash, they dri drive fast, they drive slow and there's not an aeroplane strip there. So we are making um, a solution they, uh, with vertical takeoff and landing. It's a hybrid between uh, a multicopter and a plane so that we can take off vertically and then fly horizontally. And we can hover over the, the cars if they stand still, if they've been driving out of the track, etc. So this is a, um, an example of an A3 documentation sheet. So if you're going to the logical view, top level, the logical view of the UAV, uh, we see what parts the UAV shall be built up of, like an airframe, a uh, flight computer, power, thruster system, that's the propellers, uh, car tracking system, etc. Servos. And here the yellow lines are the electrical connections, the blue are the mechanical interfaces, and the red are sensor signals. It makes it easy to understand uh, what shall be what it shall be built up of. Especially for the mechanical designers, it's uh, very good to see actually what's going inside it. You can see that there could be a lot of cables and the sensors and computers actually could take up a little space. As we experienced this year, cables takes a lot of space, so we had to build a box uh, on top of the fuselage, actually. Um, so this is before we have decided what kind of fuselage, what kind of computer, what kind of power. Uh, it's the concept, it's the logical view. So if you go down to the functional view, it's uh, the functional view and the sub-function of capture video. We see here we have to fly the UAV, we have to track car, have to record footage, process video and control UAV. And in between we have defined all the signals or all the information that shall be go from one function to another. That's a good way to make sure the engineers will um, will have the same same meaning of the system and um, that they are designing the right thing when they start doing detailed design. So if we go into track car subfunction, it's further decomposed into a new function. Here uh, we use image processing for recognizing the different cars. We are going to put a symbol, a circle on top of the roof of the cars and then we have to film uh, we have to film uh, the cars by the camera and um, we have a template in the computer on the fl flight computer and um, if there's a match with the filmed car it will send the target position uh, to to the computer um, so I will show you just how it works so you can get a glimpse of it. Here's no sound because yeah, we haven't put music or something into it so you don't need to bother about that. Here you see the icon that shall be on top of the car and here's a square and that means match and the camera is following the image here. And here's the GPS coordinates. And when they jump behind the cars, it said target not match. Target not found, sorry. So, that's um, how we recognize the cars. Uh, but then we need to stabilize the camera. This summer we just tested it on the on ground. But next year we have to get the camera up in the air and because of the vibration during flight 
we need to stabilize the camera. And here's another function for that in the track car sub function. So here's the stabilize and point camera. We need to uh, adjust the camera in all directions, your pitch and roll in X, Y, and Z. And measure the orientation and the output is care the camera orientation. So um, here in the bottom of the uh, architecture, we see that there's a link to the logical architecture, and here is a link to the physical model. I will show you both. This is the logical view of camera gimbal concept. Here, the students did not have time to make all drawings, but we see it shall consist of gimbal motor in your pitch and roll axis. We shall have dampening. Uh, it shall be mounted to the fuselage. We're going to have an inertial measurement unit. And here you see the different kind of say, connections, mechanical interfaces, and sensor signals. For mechanics, you can see here the bolts. And here's the power and the orientation. And here is the final 3D model that was designed this summer. And we also have here a demonstration of it. We built it also. Here you can see, without stabilizer, the image is shaking a lot. And then we put on the stabilizer the image is quite still, so it works. And it was actually because of the system architects in our group that we found out we must to have a camera stabilizer, a gimbal, and a different camera than we believed we should have. Because the system students, they were having the overall picture, and they were able to to see the links between the image processing group, the mechanical groups, and to see that here's a missing link, and that's the camera gimbal, and we need a new camera. So it has a very important functions, function to have system architects doing system work. So if I want to show you a more a bit uh, this, a more about uh, uh, this, um, physical 3D, the design of the fuselage or the total airplane. I'll go back to the uh, second level of the top function, the capture video folk race. Here with, you know, the flight UAV, track car, process video, record footage, etc. So here I go down to the fly the UAV. And we see that there's some requirements allocated to fly the UAV. That will say requirements uh, concerning the aerodynamics and the mechanical shape of the wings and aeroplane. And then we right click on the uh, function. We right click here on the function and up comes and the documentation that is allocated to that particular function. And here are the concepts for an A3 showing the vertical takeoff and landing concepts. We have this summer the students were based on their requirements and the functional decomposition. They were designing different kinds of VTOL concepts. And then we made two proto prototype. One prototype with the winning concept here. It's a, it's a tilt rotor plane, which you uh, saw in the film, where the rotors are tilting when you're going to fly forward. And here are the three of the design. Here are the rotors that shall be tilting forwards or upwards uh, if you are want to operate like a quadcopter or an aeroplane. And here's another concept designed this year with wings in the fan and a 
a rotor which is tiltable at the, at the tail. And these are showing last year's concepts and the um, concept from 2012. And by storing uh, these concepts of uh, the drones, then we can see, okay, um, they rejected that design, and then why, why should, why did they do it? Then you can go in and look at the A3s, and then you don't want to do the same mistake again. You can, the, the goal with the model-based design is that you shall store your information during the design phases. You're going to write a short A3 during the design phase and the development phases and upload it uh, easy during your work rather than wait until the end and write a long written report. So then it will be easier for the ones that come the next year or the other disciplines during your design that they can find exactly the information they need. You know, if we go back here, they can go into exactly what kind of function they want and find information. They can find, okay, you designed it this way. Why is that? Is that because the requirements told you to do so? Um, so it's a kind of good way of communicating between disciplines. So um, to sum it up, we can say that this model-based design is alive and it's dynamic. You can easily change one part of it without having to redesign all of it. And you can... Um, um, so, and it's always in change. It's dynamic, so it's nothing you just are finished with this date or another date. It's during, it follows during the entire uh, development life cycle. Um, so if you quit, uh, the next person who's going to take over your tasks, he, he will find your work quite easily and can, I think it will be easier to take over your, your role or your work. So it will improve the communication across functions uh, and levels between different kinds of engineers. It will be easier to uh, confirm that you are talking about the same thing and it will be easier to, to, uh, to uh, communicate. And between levels, um, marketing people can understand it the salespeople can use the behavior description to confirm with the customer that this is really what he or she wants. And with using this model-based structure, we think that engineers would use time on development rather than documentation. They shall document easy and, you know, don't use not a lot of time of writing reports, just the essential uh, part of the work shall be documented on an A3 and uploaded into the model. And of course you get easy access to relevant knowledge and information. That is very important in the local Hawk project when we have only seven weeks of development. Then the students will find the information um, quite easy. Instead of having to look in a long report after one little thing, they can just go straight into, is it a computer or is it the autopilot they are interested in? They find the information they need just right there. So the effort will increase efficiency. We think people will uh, do the things they shall, uh, whenever they shall do it, and uh, yeah, do the right things at the right time. And then it will, of course, then reduce the costs in the development projects before, because all the work we do before we start building and development, we are using a lot of time on uh, the requirements, the functional decomposition and the logical concepts, rather than just start 
making the first study at once. So using a little bit more time in the early phases of the project will reduce the costs. So do you have some questions uh, or was it something I said that was not uh, so easy to understand? Uh, just tell me. Yes, uh, thank you very much Gudrun. This is Ketil uh, then again. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, now, um, I will, uh, what I will try to do is to unmute everybody. Uh, before I do that, please be, bear in mind that you, you will be online, all of you, uh, at the same time. Yeah. Uh, so from Henry Syrialainen, Syria uh, he's, uh, he's questioning, how about system usability? Was it easy to learn how to use CATIA RFLP? Uh, the, stu uh, the students, they took it quite easy and I think that um, especially we didn't use it this year but the 2014 version of CATIA, I think it uh, has a very good usability and yes. the, the students, they took it good. Of course, the, the, the system students, they were here two weeks in beforehand to learn how to work with it. Okay. So, um, for for all of you guys, uh, Kongsberg KDA has been working on the 13X for some time, two years. Uh, they are running two environments, one environment for the local Hawk and actually in parallel they are also running an industrial version on the 14X. So, KDA is validating both uh, the solutions at this time. And uh, moving forward, the comment would be that uh, that the target would be working on 14x. So uh, usability yeah. is improving. I have another question from Lars Hansen. How much work did you have to do on K Katia and Ovia to have RFLP working? Tricky um, question. That that was uh, exactly not my part or the students' no. part. That was uh, done by the IT department here or get over, yeah. you know, so yeah. uh, I guess uh, Ketil uh, has a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, Lars, uh, Lars Hansen, uh, I think um, I think it's two different aspects, it's the infrastructure, installing everything IT-wise is some uh, issues. Yeah, uh, it's 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 quite play, plain uh, straightforward. Actually, it has been yeah. working very nice. The other aspect is how you implement and, and start using it uh, as a user, and this is what you communicate. The students is actually up and running in a couple of weeks. Yeah, and that was uh, for the for the students who had never been into Katia. They they were in there very fast, and yeah. It didn't take a lot of time. Of course, the students, they are used to use different kinds of programs and they have been learning at school to use a lot of different software. So I think it's quite easy for them to switch among tools rather than maybe people who have been using the same CAD system for <laughs> 10 years, of course. <laughs> 10 years? Even yeah. even more even, even more. more yeah. <laughs> I think I think it's a good comment, and the, the new generation are are adapting very fast. But I think it's uh, going from Katia V5 to V6 is some change. But uh, I think it's more in in thinking in different le levels. Is it is uh, thinking yeah. in R, thinking in F and L and P is a is a bigger challenge, I guess. Yeah, and, and the layout of the new CATIA 2014X, that's, that's yeah. very similar to the new, you know, iPads and smart telephone. And you can see all the functions that you are using. Uh, yeah. not, you don't see the unnecessary functions that you're not using right now. Uh, okay. but so, so that's, you know, I think that's a very good improvement. Uh, but to just be clear, that was not the version I used in the slides here. That was the, okay. the old one, yeah. 
that was the old one. That's correct. Yeah. So uh, Rene Steiner from Yasaki, he, has, uh, he, he asked for a presentation and the presentation will be available afterwards. Yeah. Uh, Rene also had another question. He is uh, asking if you're applying RFLP in your department. Um, I'm not quite sure about that yet. Uh, I think they are using this, this in, is, in, yeah. in the Kong is using parts yeah. of DC. Yeah, we have different projects running in parallel, so yep. uh, there's there's one part of the department that is using it. But of course, the methodology is the systems engineering methodology is something we use, but not knowing we are using it. <laughs> yeah. So it's um, it's just you know implementing the tool then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it's it's uh, fair to say it's on the way to be uh, deployed industrially, and uh, it's kind of a matter of time when the right project comes up. Uh, you are kind of ready to do that in the RFLP mm. environment, but you you are you have projects that's lost for many many years. Uh, uh, developing missiles so the real projects they they have a slower pace than the students can have so yeah. you, you when when doing this together with the students you have a really good opportunity to play with new technology and see how it works yeah when uh, yeah, the student yeah sorry no and it seems to work so you <laughs> yeah. you would like to use it yeah, the student project is actually quite similar to a real project so that's the reason why yeah. We are doing it and using it to test the, this technology. And uh, it's good for us because then you can communicate the results and show us something. Be yeah. Because when you talk about missiles, you cannot share anything. No. Uh, so this, Francis, this... okay, I have a question from Francis Smith. He's yes. actually asking, is it possible to have revisions of the same file name but with different stages of the model? Um, I I think so, isn't it right? Yes, yeah. I think that's that's correct. Uh, yeah. We'll have you, you. You're not working in the V6 platform. You're not working with files as such, no. but you have you have uh, models. That, you have models and you have revisions. Yeah. So so the answer would be yes to that. Yeah. Okay. Any other question or comments from the audience? Francis says okay. Good. Is there anyone that would like to, I can unmute you if you'd like to discuss or, or have a direct question to, I was not able to unmute everybody, it's too many. I can unmute anyone. And if people have a question, they can send an email or something. That they can be. definitely continue. They can definitely send us these questions afterwards. Uh, yeah. But I have a question from Ole Hög here now. Mm. Uh, do you have any experience about how the digital RFLP model in Katia is adapted in a visual management organization? Um, that was not part of our, our work this summer, I think. No. No. Uh, visual management organization. I didn't. Uh, I could unmute Ole Hög if you would like to explain your question or. or yeah. Ole, uh, you are now unmuted. Can we hear you? Hello. Hello, Hello, Ole. What was uh, really the question, uh, Ole, about visual management? Or can anyone hear me? Yes, yes I. We can hear you, Ole. Can... Yes, you don't hear us. Hmm. Ule. Ule, we hear you. We hear you, Ule. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Ule. Can anyone hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. 
I just uh, have this question about how how this uh, digital approach in the criteria about the RFLP model uh, can be adapted or what will match a uh, normal um, organization that are more uh, on a, I would say, a, a um, analog way of, of discussing uh, matters about um, about, about uh, uh, designing products and product structures. Um, so if any, anyone have any ideas about how, how this is working together, the digital world, the, the digital world and the normal uh, way of doing mm -hmm. business. The analog way of sharing papers and drawing things on boards. You have a comment on that? Uh, um. Uh, I think it's easier to discuss the the product or how you should should build up the product when you look at it visually. But of course, I'm also educated and industrial designer, so I like to sketch uh, quite a lot in hand by myself. Uh, but you know, if you could have, for example, an iPad or a drawing tablet where you can draw straight into Katia, for example, that would be a nice, <laughs> a nice to have uh, application. Um, but I think it's uh, it's easier to see uh, if you draw up the product uh, in this functional structure, then you are uh, then you can ensure that you are not getting. Uh, any missing links, you know, that you are getting all the products or, or the elements in the product. Uh, I'm not sure if I I answered the question right, but... <laughs> well, I, I, I think that could be a challenge how to how to bring this how to bring this uh, information and knowledge from from the digital RFLP model into, I mean, the traditional way of, of thinking. Yeah if, yeah, if you're meaning to printing out, okay, I'm I'm going to show you how this is, and then to print out the documentation mm. or something. Then, mm. for example, the requirements we can translate them into an Excel sheet. Yeah. Uh, so that's quite easy. And then the the sh uh, and the when we translate the requirements, they are also uh, written in different layers. So it's easy to see where the requirements belong. And then we have all the all the uh, documentation in in uh, A3s. Of course, you can uh, instead of mm. writing A3s, you can write Word documents. Some of the students preferred Word documents because they were used to it. So some of them made a Word document and uploaded into the, the structure in Katia. So then you can print it just as a regular document. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, I think I, I think it's a it's a valid and a very good question, uh, Ulle and uh, KDA also been uh, challenging uh, on this how to communicate this to managers to other people not using Katia, and, and yes. one of the answers from from Daso is actually a kind of a navigator RFLP navigator a cheaper, easier license that you can navigate in this structure. So you can actually not be the designer, but you can, for other people, get into this uh, this uh, material with a different license. So it is in the is it's in the roadmap from Dassault. But definitely, mm -hmm. you you uh, the idea is to 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 uh, to collaborate between different domains, software guys and the uh, electronic guys, and and things comes into one model. So this is this is a it's a big challenge. But uh, yes, it's 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 very interesting. Uh, yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, because today it's uh, a bit difficult when you're going to cooperate with people uh, who are using another software, and mm -hmm. uh, and I'm a mechanical designer, and I should like to have you know the information uh, from the. Uh, electronic engineers and the cable designer into one and also the, the logical the logical part of it if I'm designing a mechanical part you know where to put all the black box boxes you know that you're going to have a computer inside but you don't know how big it shall be 
that would be very good using the logical part of the TA. You can actually design a, a logical part in the physical model. You can, in the physical model of Katia, before you know the detailed design, you can design a black box there representing the logical par part. Hmm. Yeah, I see. Okay, I, and I uh, definitely it is not mentioned, but all of this information it goes into the Enovia database, so other users can kind of access the information going through Enovia or the mm -hmm. 3D ex experience platform in another way. So it's about sharing. Yeah. So the the requirements they are shared in or saved in in Enovia and are linked to Enovia the database. Yes. Very good. That's uh, if you have if you have if there are other questions, Ole, more on your mind. Uh, otherwise, I mute you now. Okay, okay that's fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ole. Um, I think uh, I think that was very good. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Gudrun. Uh, and if the audience uh, have more questions, you may send them to to uh, to Technia to me, Ketelomol at Technia.com. I can share this uh, email, or you can send it to. Uh, I think it was in the invitation. Mm. Uh, um, and we will share this uh, share this information afterwards. Uh, so then, thank you very much again, Gudrun, sharing this. Uh, we're looking forward to the next steps on the model-based system engineering with you. Yeah. And uh, so, thank you very much, and to the audience. Yes, and just uh, thank you for joining today. Uh, Techna will organize more webinars coming up all the time next year. Take a look at our event calendar. Uh, uh, on different topics, on the Enovia topics, on Katia topics, interesting topics. If you may have uh, some good topics you would like us to address, just give us a, a hint on that. Uh, so for this, uh, just thank you again for joining and uh, it's time to wish you all a warm uh, holiday season coming up soon. So then by this we'll close this webinar. and. Uh, Thanks to all of you.